Andrew. Yes. I told you you shouldn't be here because we're in quarantine. You tell me that every week, Jess, like actually every week. Well, we're still in quarantine and apparently this ge- this gag is just going to keep going because the world just keeps on ending. It's going to keep going because you don't have another gag. <laughs> yeah, that's really it. Um, you you want to just talk about Patreon? Fuck you. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Uh, Patreon is where you can go if you really like us and want even more of us and want to give us money. (laughs) We have a new podcast coming up for patrons only because we decided to uh, kill the Glee one. Uh, Glee is dead. (laughs) Glee is dead because uh, Glee is cursed and it's not funny to make fun of things that have so much tragedy around it right now. Absolutely. And also, if we're too involved, we may become cursed ourselves. Uh, that is also important. So what's what's the new podcast on? Because I don't actually know. It's on Fosse Verdon. Uh, the patrons voted for that. So, yeah, it was a Fosse Verdon podcast. Oh, boy. I can't wait. I've never heard of this before. <laughs> um, all right. Our current patrons are and, and this will be a good one. Terry Needleman, Max Lunick, Benjamin Lear, uh, Lily Ackles, John Donna, Taryn the Duck, the Fantastic Jess Lightning, Ewan Cassidy, Haley McDonald, Taskier, Fire of September, Mina Maniri, Monica Thoreau, Brent Black, Haley Murray, Alice in Wonderland, B Way Flicks, Nathaniel Stacey Coombe, Joseph Evans Green, Luna Rocks 222, Irigail Drew A. Whiter, Carrie Ahern, Christine Malmadel, Mezzanine Theater Diary, Mary Lou Choquette. We're only halfway through, folks. Anne Nunnally, <laughs> Kurt Bolf- Birchfield, Cole Birchfield, John Vanels, Holy Stacality, Russ Walker, Musical Hell, Emily Grace, Andrew Van Barson, Emily Stack, Kyle Summers, Mr. B, Janae C, Kyle, uh, Christina Francis, Jessica A., out of place there. Skylar, Liz Lim, Corey Wilmarth, Allison Stuller, nothing is certain except Beth and Taxes, Ren Cullen, Thespian, uh, Christelle Stapleton, and El- is El- <laughs> Elizabeth, my goodness, I messed that one up, Elizabeth Levengood. You got Irigail Drouet Whiter, but not that one. But I these folks give one. us a little extra financial support that helps us keep the lights on here. Meet schools with cheese and add to some much needed improvements, which we'll talk about a little early on in the episode. So if you'd like to join them in supporting us and get tons of fun perks, such as Patreon only podcast, our commentaries and a bunch of other stuff. Come join us at Patreon. All right, let's get on with the show. I'm sick with this. Hello, I'm Jesse McAnally and I am Andrew DeWolf. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew to like musical theater. All right, we're we, we're we're after we're in episode one hundred and one. We've crossed that one hundred episode mark. We're over the threshold, fellas. It's time we're to change everything. Threshold. We're taking an axe to it. We're cutting the show down. It's gone. Um, no, we're trying to make it better, and the best way to make it better is to make it so you and I have to do less work, and we have a, a brand new person that's going to be on with us every week. Um, let's just introduce her. Um, her name is Brianna Jones, and she will be joining us from here on in um, just to help us out. So, Bri, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Brianna Jones, as Jesse just said. Um <laughs> Yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I don't really like musical theater. That's perfect. uh, But yeah, that's what I was told. (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, I like dogs, though. I just got a new puppy. Uh, She's a Shiba Inu. This is not perfect. Very cute. (laughs) That is not perfect. Andrew hates dogs. (laughs) Andrew, you're going to have to leave this show. Frogs, Um, though. Can Can we talk about frogs? (laughs) <laughs> frogs are cute yeah i don't like um, dogs because they keep barking downstairs and they interrupt my audio <laughs> okay i mean that's understandable though yeah because mm-hmm. mine mine was just scratching at my door not too long ago um but that's okay it's all good i'll keep the dog hate to a minimum to like absolute minimum and brie what are you going to be doing here with us i am going to be helping you guys out by googling i'm here to google I'm here to edit your audio and make sure that you sound immaculate Uh, and really anything else that Jesse tells me to do, I will do. Mm -hmm. And she'll happily chime in if she's got something to say, too. I will do that. Mm -hmm. We're not going to keep her like down locked in the basement. She's allowed to talk. Okay. Good to know. Well, all right, get back in the basement. We're we're gonna start now. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. let's start. <laughs> so Andrew, Andrew, yes. how are you feeling today? Um, I, I, you know what? I I really don't have a funny thing for this. Do you have a funny thing for this? 
I I'm dying very slowly. Wait, no, I'm not. Please kiss me. I love you. I'm dying again. Please, please kiss me. I love you. Goodbye. The end. I mean, I feel like you're missing a very important, crucial plot point in, in that they have sex and then she dies. Oh, oh, I'm very ugly, too. <laughs> oh, OK. I guess that's more crucial. What are we talking about today? I'm very Jess? ugly. We're talking about Stephen Sondheim's passion. God, you are so beautiful. I love to see you in the light. Clear and beautiful, memorize every inch, every part of you to take with me. Georgia. Your feet so soft as if they'd never touched the ground. Don't. Your skin so white, so pure, so delicate. Your smell so sweet, your breath so warm. I will summon you in my mind. I'm painting you indelibly on my mind. Let me go. I must feel every moment. All this happiness. You know, I honestly, I, I genuinely thought this was going to be like a Passion of the Christ kind of thing. Like when I first loaded it up, I'm like, are we really like he has like a Mel Gibson thing going on? We're going to do this. Uh, and it's not at all that. Not even close. Not this time. <laughs> Not this time. But Passion is a one-act musical with music and lyrics by Stephen Sondheim and a book by James Lapine. The story was adapted from the Ator Scola film and call, that, that's called Passion de More, which is literally the most lazy tr translation from stage to like from screen to stage adaptation like there, that name. Its source material was written by Enigo Tarchetti um, called Fosca. Central themes include love, sex, obsession, illness, passion, beauty, power, and manipulation. Passion is a notable for passion is notable for being one of the few projects that Stephen Sondheim himself conceived, along with Sweeney Todd and Roadshow. Andrew, what is passion about? Please, please explain to everyone and Brie exactly what passion is and what it's about. All right, passion is about. Uh... I, th I don't even really fully know what time period this is, but it's like it's it's I think it's in Britain. Am I wrong? Italy. Italy? No, it's it. Like, do they talk about Rigbolti, Italy? Rigbolti, Rivetti. They're I names. Have no idea. His name's Giorgio. Oh, you're right. You're right. It is Giorgio, isn't it? I just I, I kind of thought they were like doing something fancy. OK, Italy, <laughs> Italian soldiers located somewhere in whatever. It's really not that important, but this guy is. <laughs> Taken away from his uh, his lover, who he's very passionate about. Get a passion. Hey. Uh, and he wants to be with her, but she's taken away because military. Um, and he's introduced to this new woman, Fosca, who is sickly and dying and obsessive. And uh, yeah, that's about it, actually. Uh, ugly. Also, they, they mentioned she's ugly. Honestly, she's yeah, not. It's she's not that ugly. It's Donna Murphy. She's beautiful. They just yeah. threw a mole on her and didn't put makeup on her. And it's like, oh, she's so ugly. Yeah. It's like, come on. That's rude. Rude to people <laughs> with moles, too. Like, wow. Yikes. I, I think she's really pretty as Fosca. <laughs> They're beauty marks. They're not moles. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So what did you think of it? Like, I didn't even oh, get to what? the good stuff. Come on, Jess. You're There's right, more right. after that. Uh. He the guy finds out that his actual lover is not his actual lover because she's married already. Uh, well, he knows that she's married. He's just yeah. Like she won't leave holding him. him. Yeah, she won't leave the other guy. She just yeah. yeah. He's he's being cucked. Well, actually, the husband is being cucked. But yeah, he's cucking the husband. <laughs> the, yeah, exactly. Um, but he's like, I want a real relationship now. I'm tired of just being uh, your boy toy on the side. Um. <laughs> Is that, is that the proper use of that? Probably not. Um, booty call, I think, is the right booty term call. you're looking for. And then he's like, OK, I'm just I'm going to be with this Fosca person. And then he has sex with her and she dies in the end. Well, yeah, <laughs> he also gets like her disease, her like really intense, weird, metaphorical disease of every illness at once. Yeah, well, it's it's dying disease. And the only cure is death. But also love. <laughs> love, I guess. It, this is like, 
I, I'm going to describe this to you, and I want you to tell me if you think this is apt. Sure. All right. This is Sondheim trying his best to be Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> um, what, like, how do you mean? Like, let's t- think about the period this came out in. So, literally, this went up against a show with the same basic plot, Sunset Boulevard. They came out yeah. in the same season. <laughs> it's a similar plot. It's not the same. It's similar enough where so much that Patty Lapone both played Norma Desmond and Fosca at one point in her career. Yeah. OK. Um. Yes. And it's just him being like, well, he does all these dark romances. What would be my version of a dark romance? And it very much <laughs> rings true of a man that did not have a single lover until he was 68 years old. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when he talks about what love is and what love isn't, um, it doesn't even seem like he knows what the word means. <laughs> like he both he's he, dissecting it like a fucking dissertation. Yeah, I mean, I think as far as actual love and in Sondheim did um what's it called uh, uh company company he did that, right yes. he did that right yeah I feel like he actually had the, a better idea of what love was in that show than he does in this one. But well, that's a show written before he fell in love. And this is the show written after he fell in love, which is. Oh, really? Wacky to me. Well, see, maybe he started becoming like the characters in company and he started idealizing what it actually is. Maybe, maybe. Or maybe he's just some 80 year old man dating a 30 year old <laughs> man. Then. <laughs> Ooh, is that true? Yes. <laughs> Yikes. No. OK. Gold diggers. Maybe he's the Fosca in the relationship. <laughs> he's probably dying. <laughs> he's like 90,000 years old. Of course he is. Uh, all right. So. Jess, this is your favorite Sondheim piece, as you've pr- proudly posted on Twitter already. Yes, it is. It is probably definitely my favorite Sondheim musical. Is it only because of the music or is there stuff in the plot here that you want to mention? Who else would have made this show? Let's think about that for one, because this is a musical based on a movie the same as fucking Beetlejuice, Bring It On and all that. Those are all things that this has in common. Who would pick this movie aside from Sondheim? This is the most Sondheimian musical ever. (laughs) Yeah, it's I mean, it certainly has his style and it's very like adult like very adult like it's mm-hmm. not like a other music musicals that are based on movies are all like very commercial uh looking to cash in uh i don't think this is trying to cash in on anything <laughs> other than maybe sondheim maybe that's why it, yeah <laughs> maybe that's why it flopped <laughs> Ooh, wait wait really it it was very well received but didn't do well like most of sondheim's later work and this as far as right now was the last show he's put like officially on Broadway. Like, and this was the nineties and this is his third collaboration with James Lapine after into the woods and Sunday in the park with George. So has he put anything out since this or is this his, uh, last I mean, he hurrah. wrote a new song for into the woods that wasn't used. Um, he did road show, which never made it to Broadway and was also retitled like 40 times. He's done like additional rewrites to company for the female edition because they've made her a female in more recent versions. But he's never actually written like a full show that made it to Broadway since this. No, this is the last one. This is technically his opus, so to say. It's a little bit sad. I feel like he could do better. Why, though? I think it's his (laughs) best work. (laughs) You think this is his best work? I do. Or at least his most personal work. Maybe his most personal. I still think Sweeney Todd is better. Well, this and Sweeney Todd are the one of the only ones he's ever sought out himself. That's true. Um, This is probably the closest to Sweeney Todd he's been. I would say that. I think I like this better than Company. I will say that. Uh, I'm not sure how he came up with Company. Was that like somebody else's thing? And he just that was someone else's play series of short plays that he just added music to yeah i think this is better than that uh but i think sweeney todd is his is his best work that i've seen 
I mean, you've gone through a good chunk of his things. I mean, I know you're really holding out for the frogs because you're a weirdo. But... Yeah, I mean, I'm just hoping that the frogs is kind of the best thing ever made. Like, I'm <laughs> very, very hopeful for the frogs. I'm assuring you it is not. <laughs> Honestly, I'm hyped for the frogs, and I, I really think that that should be our 150 episode. I, I, I think that might actually be it, but... <laughs> What is, what is it about? Is it like cats? It's like cats, right? With the frogs? No, it's Aristotle's Aristophanes the frogs. Like literally, it's like Dionysus going through the river Styx. Dude, it's Dionysus nothing. is awesome. I love Dionysus. And he's played by Nathan Lane, which is also great. <laughs> like, how is that bad? Dionysus? I don't know. The river well, Styx? It's like Hades Town. But like with, you're getting with the, me, so, you're with the drunk me on a show that I know is bad. Stop it. It's like Hades Town with the drunk god instead of the death god. <laughs> like, how does that fail? And there's frogs, apparently. I don't know. Is there frogs, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, Andrew, think back on all the Sondheim shows we've covered. Sunday in the Park with George, Into the Woods, um, Company, Sweeney Todd, mm -hmm. Merrily. Where does this fit in there? Where does passion fit among those? Um, let's see. I think it's below into the woods. Like Sweeney Todd into the woods. Really? Passion merrily, maybe, maybe company above that. I'm not sure. You'd put company above merrily. Maybe though. It kind of gets muddled there because they're all those ones are kind of the same to me. <laughs> is like how prints work you think is like well our pacific overtures where does that fit in oh that one uh yikes i have no idea where i put that one that <laughs> one's just that one's just weird I, I almost like i don't know if i can put that on the same list and that one that one is the least santimian it's it well he's trying not to be like intentionally so but then you have like the ultimate sondheim song like in someone in a tree and then it just goes back to being insane non-music it's good. It's just it's very good. weird. All right. Um, so what did you think about all the uh, mutton chops in this show? Like, did you think there was I, enough of them? Do you? I, there's never enough mutton chops. Um, but I, 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 I don't want to talk about that right now. <laughs> I want to talk to you about Fosca as a character. OK, because there is a lot of trepidation with her throughout the preview process. So. When she first came on, like in the very first early preview productions, everyone hated her. They hated her so much. Anytime she would come on stage, they would start booing. And <laughs> when she fell down after the is this what you call love segment segment, people would scream <laughs> die, Fosca, die. <laughs> what? Wait, you're not. You're serious. This happened. <laughs> Why? This was an audiences hated this character so much. Why? <laughs> I'm going to ask you the same question because I have my answer and I'm very curious as to what you think of her in the final version. I mean, I have known people that have like a similar. Not I want to say a similar mindset, but not quite the same. Uh, yeah, if you've ever met somebody who has like no friends at all and you're like the one person to talk to them, they will never <laughs> they will never leave you alone. They will never, ever let you go. Uh, like there was this this person at, at college that I met uh, and he was like, you know, he he definitely had some sort of developmental issue or some sort of something like that. But he was very hardcore uh, uh, Trump trumpet uh, Trump Trump supporter. Yikes. He, yeah. So nobody would talk to him. But I was like, well, this guy obviously has some issues and I don't think he's really a political concern for us. So I feel like it's OK if I talk to him for like a little bit um, and then he never let he never, never let me go. He would just every time he saw me, he'd talk to me for like five minutes. He continues. He still messages me on, on uh, Facebook to this day. Uh, and like it's just because one of these type of people like who have no friends at all, they need someone to connect to. So I can kind of see where she's coming from and that like no one has ever really been like with her and nice. now she's like obsessive. even remotely nice and then she becomes kind of obsessive about it you know mm -hmm. but do you do you think that like i don't even see her that different from like a nerd character in a movie a male nerd character that gets the girl in the end through like utter sheer will like that's a cliche in most romantic comedies even 
Yeah. Although I think some people would argue that's a bad cliche that we should get. It rid is of. a bad cliche, but, but the reason why people reacted so violently to this is probably like the internalized misogyny of just seeing a female in doing that, that same role. But yeah, I was actually considering when watching this, I was like, I wonder how this would fly if it was like gender switched. It would be Forrest Gump. Yeah, because it's like. It, it might actually fly better like because i think people would respond better to a man constantly pursuing a woman right and unrequited love between a man and a woman and all that like brie you're on here what do you think about that trope of like men and men chasing after women in like media and unrequited love it's bullshit (laughs) can i curse on yeah of course go for it we've done it like 20 times no no fucking swearing (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> damn it god damn it um, <laughs> um yeah i mean unrequited love it's so overdone but have you ever seen it with like a really obsessive female character because that's what this is i think i have seen it but it's usually done in like a very negative light like it's like oh isn't she a weirdo like oh yeah oh yeah yeah it's, she's weird <laughs> she's crazy you know it's mental illness you know, but this one does it, too, but also frames her as the one that deserves it in the end. Like she's yeah. the hero, so to say, like, I think that if she wasn't if she wasn't portrayed as like sickly, the obsession level that she's at is a little bit creepy. And I can admit to that, like if she was just a normal person and she was this obsessive about someone, that is a little weird because like she she follows him around like everywhere it's kind of it is kind of uh stalker-esque um but you see that in media you do you do see that in media uh, what i'm saying is that it, it maybe isn't okay but i think the way that they frame the character makes it okay because it's like well she doesn't have anybody you know and like of course this is gonna happen that's her character <laughs> you said you were saying brie Oh, I was, I, okay, I watch Korean dramas. I don't want to get off topic, but basically, and one I'm <laughs> off watching. Off topic is our thing. Off topic Perfect. is our thing. Perfect. But basically, <laughs> in the one I'm watching right now, it's the girl has a, like a personality disorder. She doesn't have any friends. She doesn't have any family. She's an orphan. And she literally follows this man, like two different cities he goes to because she loves him and she wants to be with him. But she also, it's also like kind of posed as she has this, mental illness and she doesn't want to be alone and it's kind of the same i guess you could say no it's very similar i wonder if she'll get it and then die <laughs> she'll ever get laid and then die in the sexual <laughs> experience die immediately i haven't finished the series but i'll keep you updated <laughs> all right dick's so good you die <laughs> <laughs> that's all a woman wants you know yeah, well, uh, <laughs> and all a man Speaking wants of... is to catch the worst disease that's ever been existed because of love. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of horrible dicks, what do you think of Count Ludovic of Austria, which is something that was not in the original film, but added by Sondheim and Lapine to this musical to give Fosca a backstory? Um, the Count being like her uh, almost Ex- boyfriend. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's a rude guy. <laughs> he doesn't <laughs> pay no, he that's... doesn't pay the rent and then he leaves. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he steals her dowry, wastes all of the money of her and her family, and then when he's found out that he's been cheating, he's like, "Yep, and I haven't paid the rent, and fuck you." <laughs> it is like the most comically evil character shoved in the middle of this like very intense drama where everyone is kind of like very dubious and like very and you you just have this must mustache twirling fucking (laughs) villain he just kind of come like does he even he's not any of the characters that are in like the present are is he because he is like a flashback character isn't he yeah he's a flashback character yeah he is it's kind of funny when he said that he didn't pay the rent i laughed like (laughs) it was funny that's so that's so silly i don't think it's ridiculous i don't think it's necessary at all it, and honestly, I think it actually kind of hurts it a little bit because I feel like having Fosca be a character that has never been loved, like in any way, would have been yes. stronger. But I can see 
the reason why they would want that, because also it would have been a very short musical. It's a one act as is and still fairly short. It's like an hour and a half. Yeah. And you kind of want to paint Fosca's backstory because they said she was like in her early 20s, but looks like a thousand. Yeah. I don't know. Um, maybe so you maybe have something from where her, she's been. Maybe have something from her childhood or, or something like that. Well, they cover that, but it and you also kind of wanted to give a reason for the the captain. Um, I forget the the main guy, the cousin. Oh, for the... him to feel responsible for Fosca's position. Where he was like, I was just happy someone wanted her because she was so ugly. I didn't I was blinded because I just wanted to be rid of her. And that's on me. And now I'll forever be guilty about that. And then when Giorgio is like, fine, finds himself actually attracted to her. He's like, nope, nope, I ain't falling for this shit again. I want you dead, motherfucker. Yep. I, I get why you kind of want to set that up. But with a ridiculously evil character like that. <laughs> yeah. I feel like they could have done it in a more subtle way. But honestly, I'm OK with it. It's funny. It's a it's a good laugh line. It's a good joke. I mean, that entire thing is a huge joke, but it's also f funny to say that they mentioned that she had a baby and it died in childbirth, which is also something that's. I don't know, that didn't fit. <laughs> Wait, so that means that she has had sex before. Yes, that is the main thing, that reason why I'm bringing it up. And didn't die. And also yes. went through childbirth and didn't die? Yep. What and disease does she have? Started. Like, what sickness and then the sickness have? started after that. Do they ever say what it is that she has? It is he, the doctor, which might be the most useless doctor in any form of media I have ever seen. <laughs> yeah, he's like... Uh, can you go see her? Like, I think she might be dying. Can you go check her on her? <laughs> you know, if you just make her think you love her, she might live a little bit. And it's like, oh, man, I guess now you do love her, but I'm not going to let you see her now because <laughs> it's dangerous. <laughs> it's dangerous. Yeah. Well, did he say what she had? Because I don't remember. He said it is an ailment of all the ailments is basically it. OK, so she had she had COVID-19 and it was. over. <laughs> she, and then she gave it to Georgia. She didn't wear a mask and gave it to everybody there. Rest in peace, all. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. All right, Andrew, who do you think the most relatable character was? Um. I mean, as far as who I could relate to, probably one of the, the guys that play that was playing pool <laughs> and like just kind of one chilling. of the most useless. <laughs> I mean, oh, he I'm, probably keeps a journal. I'm one of the most useless people I've known. So <laughs> to be fair, I'm sure you relate very strongly to Fosca because you you feel like you're dying at all seconds of the day. I was going to say the, <laughs> the cousin, you know, the one that's like there and involved, but everything's just happening underneath your nose. And then you get shot by some guy, <laughs> <laughs> some guy that I am obscenely nice to, like throughout the entire show. Oh, he didn't throw away his shot, to be fair. He yeah. Uh, as far as musical duels, this is this is a 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10. No throwing away the shot. <laughs> the shots were not thrown away. Um, can I talk very briefly before our mid show about the opening scene between Giorgio and Clara? And oh, we didn't even talk about Clara. We didn't. And we'll talk about her a little bit here, um, specifically because of how this show opens and how Sondheim was trying to structure this but failed to. So he wanted the show to both begin and end with an orgasm. That was <laughs> his. <laughs> of course, that's what he wanted. <laughs> I want the show to begin and end with an orgasm. You say that in the British accent when he is like the most American man in the world. It's like, I want the show to begin and end with a lady's <laughs> orgasm. But then I realized that they needed a coda afterwards to wrap up all the rest of the plot. So we couldn't do that. Mm. Still mad didn't happen. Mm. <laughs> he could have he could have cut it short. He could have cut it short. <laughs> Well, you kind of need to wrap up the plot. You can't just end with him fucking Fosca to death. <laughs> <laughs> then the curtains go up and everyone starts bowing. All right, bye. <laughs> <laughs> everyone out of you the audience. To, 
<laughs> We're finishing. We're done. Well, mm, mm. <laughs> but no, in the original Broadway cast, um, and not in the recorded production for obvious reasons, there is full frontal nudity in the song Happiness. They are both butt ass naked, titties out. Oh yeah. In the like Marin Maisie had her tits out. I saw it. <laughs> No, back in those days, that was pretty rare. Like, dicks out, tits out, bush scene, like, they're just naked through that entire song. You know? They should have they kept it. My question is why? I mean, I get, like, oh, the intense sexuality and the objectification, then we show a Fosca and she's, like, this ugly, homely woman when she isn't because she's Donnie Murphy, but... <laughs> <laughs> and trying to just juxtapose those two things... But I don't understand the point of it. I, I really think there needs to be a point behind nudity, especially on stage when you're literally in front of 400 eyes. The point is uh, to get the children out of the out of the audience like quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, that that might work. But do you th why do you think it was there? The, the blind, the blatant nudity in the very opening scene. I, I think it was it's there to make you think that those two characters are a lot closer than they are because you never see two characters that close with each other like that. They're actually naked in anything. So like to see two characters like that, it's like well, except porn, of course. But to see two characters <laughs> like that, it's like it's like, man, they must be they must be really close. And they're singing about how happy they are and how in love they are. And like I kind of bought into it. I thought that they I thought they were going to be the main couple, but they aren't. Yeah, I mean, I guess that is. It's kind of to get you like looking up and be like, oh, wow, oh, this is different than I expected it to be. <laughs> <laughs> and then nothing like that ever happens in the show ever again. But there had to be so many like they had to figure out where to put the mic packs when you're naked. Like they had to hide both the mic and her mic pack in her wig, then get her into a dress and rehook up her mic and all that. So all this shit just to show some titties. Fair for like, it's a pain in the ass for no reason. I, I am baffled to this day. Um, he wanted it to begin and end with an orgasm. <laughs> from the audience or from the actors? We don't know. <laughs> it is weird because and this is the last time we, we still haven't talked about Clara, but whatever. Um, when the show opened in London, um, instead of the usual missionary sex that they get in the U.S., they're doing a doggy style, oh. which is a weird change. <laughs> they're still butt ass <laughs> naked, tits and dicks out, but now it's doggy style and Michael Ball's on stage. So so now it's like uh, American Psycho or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even have nudity in American Psycho, the musical. This is the second musical we've had that have that had full frontal nudity. And it's never the ones you expect it to be. Which one was the other one? I talked about it. It was in Bridges of Madison County, which is also wacky as shit. Wait, what? <laughs> Dude, you don't even remember our own episode. I don't remember that episode. Because <laughs> I remember it was so pointless. Dude, she gets. Dude, I barely remember that show. <laughs> okay, so she gets out of the bathtub and she just stands naked for a bit, then puts on a towel. It is the You're most right. You're right. It's pointless. Why the fuck is it there? That's like something they would do in like a, a cheap slasher movie just to be like, <laughs> oh, well, we got our tick, our tits in there. Check mark. <laughs> but it's the bridges of Madison County. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's go into a mid show, guys. <laughs> Oh, hello. Welcome to our mid-show announcement. I didn't see you there. Oh, wait, you've been there for like 30 minutes now. That's crazy. Jess is going to read our Patreon stuff. Our current patrons are Terry Needleman, Max Lunig, Benjamin Lehrer, Lily Ackles, John Donna, Taryn the Duck, The Fantastic, Jess Lightning, Ewan Cassidy, Haley McDonald, Tess Gear, Fire September, Mina Maniri, bon Monica Thoreau, Brent Black, Haley Murray, Allison Wonderwide, B-Way Flicks, Nathaniel Stacey Coombe, Joseph Evans Green, Luna Rocks 222, Irrigale Drouet Whiter, Carrie Ahern, Christine Malmedel, Mezzanine Theater Diary, Mary Lou Choquette, Anne Nunnally, Cole Birchfield, John Vanells, Holly Stistically, Russ Walker, Musical Hell, Emily Grace, Andrew Van Barr, 
person. Emily Stack, <laughs> Kyle Summers, <laughs> Jessica A, Mr. We're B, Janae C, man. Kyle, Christina Francis, Skyler, Liz Lim, Corey Wilmarth, Allison Stoller, Nothing is Certain but Beth in Taxes, Ren Cullen, Thesbian, with a B, Crystal Stapleton, Elizabeth Levengood. They give us a little extra financial support that helps us keep the lights on here at Musicals with Cheese. If you'd like to join them in supporting us and get tons of fun perks, such as patron-only commentaries, our episodes a day earlier, even earlier, come join us over at Patreon. All right, you ready to get back to the show, you guys? Uh, yeah. Andrew, what do you think about the opening number, happiness, or the titties number? I'm so happy I'm afraid I'll die here in your arms What would you do if I died like this right now here in your arms That we ever should have met is a miracle No, inevitable inevitable, yes, but I confess it was the look The look The sadness in your eyes The day when we glanced at each other We were were both unhappy Unhappiness can be You pitied me How quickly pity leads to love I think it's a really good start, actually. Quite like it. Uh, And not just because they're naked. That is not the main reason. I think it's actually a a nice opening, and I, I like that it sets up all the themes and everything, but not between the actual main couple. It's between, like, him and just the girl that he uh, thinks he wants, which is cool. All right. Do you want to talk about Clara for a bit while we're talking about really her real only real big song? Yeah, sure. Because she's an interesting kind of character in this where she's a very sympathetic person that is spending basically all of her stage time cheating on her husband. Yeah. She's not a (laughs) floozy. She's not an idiot. She's very intelligent. She's like, I do love you, but I have a child and I will wait for him to go to school before I try anything because I I I know what comes first in life. She's not dumb, but also compared to Fosca's like, I will love you no matter what. I would die for you. And would she do that for you? It's like, uh, OK. Yeah, um, I think he should have went with Clara. He should have just waited and not caught COVID-19 from the other girl. <laughs> Um, but I think I think what makes Clara a little bit sympathetic or or a lot of bit sympathetic is also the time period this is set Uh, women didn't really get to choose who they were husbands with so I feel like it's a lot more reasonable to expect them to cheat on their husbands when they didn't even get to pick their husband in the first place so (laughs) Mm -hmm. and she's fairly reasonable like she reads all the letters and she like She's never unreasonable, which is kind of the thing that puts her away in the end and makes Giorgio dump her. It's like, love shouldn't be a negotiation. And yeah, it it kind of is. Love has to be that. Like, as he says later, like it is isn't sudden surrender. It's tender and slow. Um, Yeah, that's kind of true. Clara is right. Clara is right. Hashtag team Clara. Team Clara. Fosca has got nothing. Fosca's a weird stalker. She's got COVID-19. <laughs> All right, has- let's go on to I read. I do not read to think. I do not read to learn. I do not read to search for truth. I know the truth. The truth is hardly what I need. This this is probably the closest thing we have to like a real I want song. And a, the, it, it's a very, very strange way to introduce a character in any musical, let alone one where we're supposed to be sympathetic to this person. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is your favorite show of all time, so you, 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 give me some I didn't more say that. I said favorite Sondheim show. <laughs> this is your favorite show of all time because Sondheim is your favorite writer of all time. So I still think Parade is my number one musical of all time. Let's be fair. I, you're the number one fan of the fan club that we always make fun of. Uh, <laughs> the Jason <Robert> Brown. <laughs> <laughs> um, I 
this is like, imagine you're sitting there and you're like, oh, I lent this girl some books and maybe she'll be pretty. Then she comes out and she looks ugly, quote unquote, and while looking like Donna Murphy. And then she's like, I, I love the book. And he's like, oh, yeah, it was great. You should have thought about it a little more. And she's like, I don't read to think about things. I read because I'm trapped <laughs> in this horrible existence and I hate my life. I read so I can pretend that I live a happy life. God damn it. I hate my life. <laughs> Also, do you want to go walking sometime? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also like your boss's relative that just wants to hang out with you and is like, you know, I could probably get you more leave time if you do what I say. Like that kind of manipulation. Like it's an awkward situation to be in. Fosca's a bad person. Also, uh, she enjoys media incorrectly. You should think <laughs> about what you read. You should think about what you read. You should think about what you watch. Uh, you shouldn't just passively enjoy things. Not everything is a Marvel movie, okay? No, no, no. That is not what she's saying. <laughs> what she's saying is much more insane. What she's saying is, I watch things so I could be in them. <laughs> Pretend I have their life. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, I like I like how she's portrayed, though, especially in the first couple songs, because she is like weird. <laughs> like actually weird not like theater like goofy weird like be more chill girlfriend weird Remember yeah no that? no not not like quirky she's like what <laughs> <laughs> she does have like some great poetic lyrics in this specifically um when she goes into there's a flower with bitter with delicious nectar at the top a bitter poison underneath um as a metaphor for like if she takes in too much of re fantasy life and believing it she will get to the poison underneath she just wants to skim off the top of life like there is some beautiful poetry in just this opening number that we hadn't seen before this because it's pretty straightforward soldier talk and clara i want to fuck you <laughs> does this say anything about how she views love I don't know if she even thinks about love until he like brings it up. Like Giorgio kind of dug his own grave here when he was walking through, like walking with her. And he's like, you know, love is great. She's like between like relatives or friends. He's like, no, no, the love where you get to your dick sucks. That one's great. <laughs> and then she okay. has like a nervous breakdown. She's like, I will never know that love. I'm too ugly and sick. I don't know. I, I just think about it, though. She likes to read books, but she doesn't like to think about them deeply or really explore anything about them. Does she think the same way about her her love interests? Like she just wants the the skim off the top, like just, a, oh, he's nice to me and, and that's great. And she doesn't want to like actually think deeper about it. I think so, because remember at one point she's like, you love a man loves his dog. Why can't you love me like that? Like taking what she can get, like give it. A, yeah, and she'll take a mile kind of things. Yeah. So maybe the poison, maybe it's all a big metaphor. And this song sets the whole show up. The poison is when she finally gets it. She fucking dies. The semen. <laughs> the poison is this. The semen. <laughs> semen would actually be venom, but that's fine. <laughs> Um, yeah, let's go on to like the most like manipulative, manipulative scene in this, which is I wish I could forget you, which is like in the midpoint of the show. I wish I could forget you, erase you from my mind. Cannot leave the thought of you behind. That doesn't mean I love you. That doesn't mean I love you. I wish that I could love you. Please. The doctor basically guilt trips Giorgio into spending the night with Vasca. Yes. <laughs> Which is the weirdest <laughs> thing that I think happens in the whole show. And then really? he ends up like he ends up like sleeping in her bed. It's like weird. And she's also not even like the doctor was saying that, like, she is like going to die like right now. And he goes there and she's not. And he ended <laughs> up like sleeping in her bed a little bit. And it's like, OK, well, that was a bad move. 
<laughs> well, no, she he comes in. He's like, I've come to like say hello and say whatever and hang out with you for the night. And she's like, come sit on my bed. Come. No, no, lay. Put your feet up. And it's like literally one thing and then another thing, then demanding another thing until she eventually is like, all right, before you leave, write me a letter. Dictate me a letter. And then she writes a love letter from him to herself. <laughs> I like that part, though. <laughs> I think that's hilarious. It's like so yeah. depressing and it's a beautiful song for one. Like, I think the song is actually proper gorgeous. Yeah. But it really just it, it shows all of the weirdness of this show and how strange her character really is. It's sad. It really is sad. It It is, but it's also got that weird. I can see why people laugh at this show when they first saw it, like why they were so off put by the entirety of the show. Yeah, well, it's off putting and I think it's intentionally so. Yes, but if you're going to a Sondheim show, you shouldn't be fucking expecting the Phantom of the Opera for one. Which this is decidedly no. not. Also, you should be put off by the Phantom of the Opera. That's a weird show, too. <laughs> yes, but this show knows it's weird. The fan of the opera is convinced like, oh, no, you should be on the side of the ugly person. He's a good man. Except for like he's actually objectively not in the sh in the show that he's from. But yeah, whereas Fosca, <laughs> like, she has she has some sympathetic moments. <laughs> All right. Can we talk about is this what you call love? I fucking love this song. Yes, of course we can talk about this. You think that this is love? I'm sorry that you're lonely. I'm sorry that you want me as you do. I'm sorry that I fail to feel the way you want me to feel. I'm sorry that you're ill. I'm sorry you're in pain. I'm sorry that you aren't beautiful. But yes, I wish you'd go away and leave me alone. This is the best song in the show. Um, Agreed. He just turns and snaps on her and it's like oh my goodness it's brutal it's brutal he's been like <laughs> keeping his t temper back so long and you can see it building in him where he's just trying to say the right things trying not to make her mad trying not to lead her on like he doesn't try to lead her on at all but he no. also is trying not to push her away and be mean and this is the moment where he he just goes into the woods to read a letter from his his the girl he's cucking the husband of and <laughs> she's like you've come a long way to read her letters and he's like please go away and she's like no and then he just like I I hate you. I'm sorry that you're ugly. I'm sorry that I don't like you. I'm sorry that you're sick. I'm sorry I can't help you, but go the fuck away, please. Oh, man. And it's so it's like almost sad because it's like, you know how bad she probably feels about that. But like. She Someone had to it say it. Bit. Somebody had to say it. Uh, I love the framing of it, too, like in the show, at least the version we watched, like he's sitting on like a rock and she's like knelt down below him, like behind him almost. And he like turns back mm -hmm. to like yell at her. Uh, it's <clears throat> it's really good, like staging. It's beautiful staging. And also it's used very well in the in a song later on that I want to talk about. But there's specific descriptions of what he thinks love is. And later on, that is basically used against him by himself. Yeah. Mm hmm. And it's gorgeous, gorgeous lyricism. And I know you're not a big fan of the lyrics and the music is also very good. But specifically, he's still kind of being nice to her despite yelling at her. He's not saying I hate you. Get uh, you're gross. He's like, everywhere I go, you're there or I know you're around. And I don't like that. I, like this is obsession and it's not healthy. <laughs> and he's right. Like he's not calling her a bitch or he's not insulting her. No, he's just like, telling you know, when he her, says she's like, ugly. He just says, I'm sorry, you're not beautiful. I'm sorry you had a hard life, but that's not my fault. Yeah, just please leave me alone. Like, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, um, let's talk about us loving you briefly. Loving you is not a choice. It's who I am.
So this song was one of the last ones written for the piece. And this is already a musical that doesn't have many songs. Cause it, it like it has a lot of music in it, but not many like big numbers. Mm-hmm. So this was written because every time he people saw Fosca appear on the train with Giorgio during the scene, they would laugh <laughs> and be like, because it is so relentless at that point where he can't even get away on a train or anything. Yeah, it's just like, and they're oh, like, there we, she is. <laughs> we need a song that'll make her sympathetic in that moment was basically it. Instead of her being a joke, which she kind of becomes because it, it is pretty funny how often she pops up. Yes. So he wrote this song called Loving You, which is Possibly the most famous song from this, like Barbara Streisand's covered it and like all that. And it's a good song. It's not much to it, but it is good. Yeah. But the specific lyrics are loving you is not a choice. It's who I am. Loving you is not in my control, but it gives me purpose, gives me life like it. It's like her basically justifying her actions in a way that an obsessive sick person might and a way where it eventually ends with her saying, I will live and I would die for you. And he has to take that in and wonder, well, would Clara die for me? Would she be able to give up everything for me? Whereas Fosca doesn't have anything to give up and would give it all up for me. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Is dying for someone actually a good judge of whether or not they love you though is I really mean, a, is really media, a big question it's seen as that yeah I'd but say uh, in media in media okay i don't know if i would want to expect someone to die for me just because they love me i don't know i'd die for you andrew i love you you wouldn't die for me jess if there's a gun to my head and it said pick one or you or me i'd pick you i'd pick you you'd shoot me no. I'm going to give my two cents. Yeah, sure. Free, come on in. I wouldn't. I want to die for any man. <laughs> wow. Not even the president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. What do you think of that situation, though? Like, what do you define as like actual love, Brie? You know, throwing the philosophical the- questions right off the bat. Like, here we go. <laughs> First episode. What do you in. consider love? What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. <laughs> yeah, don't hurt me. No more. Um, I mean, what is love? I don't know. I guess love is something you feel, right? Um, <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. I just know that I wouldn't die for any man. Well, would you expect a man to die for you? Like, is dying being no, willing to take a, don't die give your me. life for someone a sign of how much you care about them? Or being a I think it's more about what you're willing to give up for someone. Are you willing to give up comfort and like all these things because you care about someone? Yeah, which is basically the question. Oh, absolutely. Death is like a whole nother level, though, because that's giving up everything all at once. Right. Well, I think Fosca just means that that's literally all that she has. Like, because really, she's on death store anyway. And she's like, she doesn't have a choice. She's going to die for everybody because, you know, she's just going to (laughs) die. So. I don't know. I think asking Clara to die for him when she has a like a son, like, come on, rude. But that wasn't what he asked for. It's basically like (laughs) Oscar's willing to give literally everything, including her life for him. But Clara won't even like leave her husband for him. It's meant to be that dichotomy where that's the question. And yeah, he'd probably have a much healthier relationship with Clara. Yeah. Just kill her husband. Easy. Have Fosca do it. She seems like she could get the job done. Yeah, Fosca, you want to die for me? How about you kill for me? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bree, I'm very curious. Um, you've sat here for nearly an hour. Like, what? Do you, what is your judgment of what this show is? Never seen it's it. Fun. <laughs> Thinks it's, it's fun. 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 I don't no, know. You I'm... guys have me cracking up. I have I have myself muted so you can't hear me, but I've been dying over here. That's good. You two are two funny guys. In See, that Hawaiian sounded shirts. very disingenuous. <laughs> I wouldn't die for either of them, but they're funny. They're funny. exactly. 
<laughs> Won't die uh, for what, you, but you make me laugh, and I love that about you. <laughs> uh, that's very. But nice. what about the show that we're talking about, Passion? What are you gleaming about it from the recording? Jess is replacing me. I know too much about musicals now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what am I taking away from it? Like, like from the discussion we're talking about, what is this show to you? <laughs> um, chaotic. It, it sounds very chaotic and um, over romanticized. Oof! Like just harsh criticism from the from the third from the host newbie. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess well. Do you have any criticisms that aren't like really catty? And <laughs> Jess, what else are we? <laughs> <laughs> it was crass and catty, catty and crass. Yeah. Do you have any criticisms that aren't catty and crass? I don't. Publicist I think, said that about us once. <laughs> I think I fit right in. That's perfect. <laughs> Jess, what's your overall thoughts on passion? Um, passion is great. I, I literally have no negative thoughts about it. Um, it's such a short th show. Like it is really like a thing that exists as it is that has no faults because it is so weird. It embraces how weird it is. And it's very refreshing to see that in like a Broadway show because Broadway shows are all now like, bring it on the musical and Shrek the musical and Beetlejuice the musical. And which are all like, classics, by the way. They're, they're all good in their way. Like even SpongeBob the musical has its good things. But this one is just so specifically itself and there's nothing I can compare it to. That made my response sound so mean. <laughs> Caddy and crass. Caddy and crass. <laughs> all I know is you guys are talking about how this girl is obsessed. Yep. And is willing to die for a man. Mm hmm. And she's ugly, according and to the show. And she's extremely ugly, hard to look at. I can't. I couldn't even look at her. <laughs> we don't even see her say, naked. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, in the actual movie, this is based on. Like they did some shit to make Fosco look terrifying looking. Like she looks properly ugly in that movie. They should have had Fosca wear like a mask of some kind, like a half mask that covers half of her face. Have it be like white. Um. And then just like remake the Phantom, Phantom of the Opera. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is kind of this kind of is just Phantom of the Opera, though, isn't it? It really is, though. <laughs> Gender bent Phantom. Yeah, basically. Except for but I feel it, like I feel like woman, Phantom... it's suddenly like less in interesting, apparently. No, I think people are more willing to sympathize with the Phantom because when a man pursues a woman, it's fine. Even though, honestly, I don't think it's good to, to sympathize with him because he's a awful character in that. Like, he is a murderer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and even the show says it. it has a specific lyric like an unattractive man can make something of himself. But as a woman, you're either expected to be a mother or a wife. And it's like a woman who is ugly has no place in these days. And it really is like a statement on that. And then the Broadway community basically fell into that. Like, because once again, this is just Phantom, an ugly person in love with an attractive person and who very basically succumbs to that by the end of it. Mm hmm. And but when it's an ugly woman, apparently the men who tend to write critic reviews just can't get behind that because they have a hard time seeing quote-unquote unattractive uh, abrasive women as sympathetic it really says something about our society i mean i'm sure it'll be reflected different nowadays but in the mid 90s it, it was a thing we live in a society jess and i am so sick of it why do we live in this society <laughs> what are your cheese rating oh wait i didn't give mine what, you didn't even give one <laughs> um, I am giving this uh, cheese rating of Telegio cheese. Ooh, what's that? It's Italian. Is there a reason? Oh, it's Italian. Ooh, bada boop. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so I think this is a, a pretty strong uh, outing for Mr. Sondheim. He, he's, uh, <laughs> he's got a lot. He's got a lot of uh, solid shows, and uh, I would count this among them. Uh, uh, wait till we see the frogs and then suddenly your opinion on it well, yeah. drops. 
Well, if he fucks up the frogs, I mean, you got Dionysus, you got frogs, you've got Greek mythology in general. How do you fuck that up? You can't fuck that up. He so fucks it up. Let me spoil he fucks it, it He fucks it up bad. <laughs> <laughs> no spoils. He doesn't fuck it up. It's going to be great. He literally um, performs it in a swimming pool. <laughs> oh, y- even better. That's where frogs would live. Dude, um, you can't even hear the audio. <laughs> they didn't think before doing this. Oh, no. <laughs> what do you think the sound's going to sound like in a fucking swimming pool, Steven? Steven, what were you thinking? <laughs> All right. But we're, we're, we're rating this show. So my cheese rating for this show. Um, and as a very special 101st episode, I don't think I've done this yet, but I'm going to give it a Gouda cheese. <laughs> It's a good <laughs> show. If I have done it before, I think I get one every hundred episodes. So I'm just going to use it right now just to get it out of the way. Yeah, the Gouda is off the table. Now, Brie, <laughs> Brie, who is also here with us. Um, and it's, and is a type of cheese. And is a type of cheese. Um, I am very <laughs> interested in your cheese rating just based on what we discussed about this show. Oh, that's not fair. Yeah, no, no, no. give, give, a, cheese give a cheese rating on our discussion. <laughs> How good was our discussion? Your discussion? Yep. Yes. Oh. How good was our episode before you even edit it and release it? Tell our audience what to think. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking some. Um, you can't say Gouda. Goat. I was going to say goat cheese with honey. Ooh, um, what? I'm into it. Hey, goat cheese you know it's a little tangy and sour but you guys were very sweet during it a little honey mm-hmm. added that, i think that describes every episode i think yeah. we've done a great job here and i think uh i think we're good to go yeah all right well you know who else did a really good job our wonderful patrons thank you guys for listening to this show please follow us on we're gonna iTunes, read your name Spotify, one more time Stitcher, here we go at musicals with cheese <laughs> our twitter is at cheesy musicals our patreon is musicals with cheese our instagram is musicals with cheese our youtube page is musicals with cheese we have the patreon of only podcasts of fossey verdon that we're just starting up right now so go check that out over at our patreon if you want to <laughs> check out e- our earlier glee with cheese stuff I guess yeah that's really that depressing now um <laughs> <laughs> shoot us an email at musical theater lives at gmail.com you can send us a lot of hate if you really didn't like how much we talked about titties in this episode we did talk about titties a lot here we don't talk about tits that much I feel we don't like talk it's about okay sex in once. general that often yeah so i mean i feel like it's fine we did it once okay yeah yeah I'm... it's a celebration yeah, a celebration <laughs> um our title card was created by the amazing jolene casco go follow her on instagram at jolene casco this episode is produced and edited by brianna jones our brand new member um so brie what is your socials because people are going to want to go follow you it's at brebus jebus um so at um b-r-e-b-u-s-j-e-b-u-s and that's instagram and I think that's really all I got. So you can follow me there. Mm -hmm. All right. And you guys know who we are, so we're not telling you that. All right. We'll see you guys next time on Musicals with Cheese. Da 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 da. Dumb.